day one, Arizona. Opening date, it's uh, middle of December. The archery deer season here has been open for a while. There's another couple of weeks left of the season and we have five or six days. All right, it's day one, first morning. I got my right hand man, Scotty, with me, and uh, my, my competitor, South Cox, and uh, his spotter in the truck behind us. We've never been here, so we're gonna head up to a glassing point. He's going to one side, we're going to the other. Hopefully with a little luck, we'll get on one today, or at least learn the area and find some deer for, for later on. But yeah, I'm excited. Slightly awake, slightly asleep, perfect morning. shooting lights right about now so uh, it's right at seven o'clock which is pretty close to legal shooting hours I, I my watch is a it's a Garmin Phoenix 6 solar and so wherever I end up going Scotty and I travel a lot we'll turn on the GPS and that'll basically calibrate or place us wherever we're at as far as the sunrise the sunset and uh, then we we know as far as legally shooting light you can look in the fish and game regulations but this always they go off the same thing we do so and then this morning it's right around 32 34 degrees yesterday was i think it was like 12 or 14 degrees in the morning so it's a little bit warmer today but it, it's going to be pretty cool all day long when it's warmer you can really bank on those deer being in their first bed by you know usually 9 10 o'clock depending upon how warm it is and one thing that people make a lot of mistakes on you really don't ever want to go after a deer in its first bed normally they'll bed down for 10 15 20 even 30 minutes and then they'll re-bed by somewhere between 9 and 10 and then that's where they'll plant all day now we're getting closer to the rut right now so a lot of that goes really goes out the window because they'll they'll be running around all day but they will bed right now they're not in the rut yet it's pre-rut so what we're hoping is we pick one up moving get him in his first bed at the very least um, kind of pin him down start to make a game plan and then when he re-beds they'll usually plant there for two to four hours once they replant that's when you want to make your stock generally when I make a stock and it'll be easier to explain in the day especially when we're on a backpack high country hunt because a lot of times that mountain range over there is the distance we're traveling 
um, you know, maybe a mile and a half on a stalk. So I'll take a photo with my phone. I have a notebook as well. And from a blown back perspective, I'll put where the deer's at. I'll zoom in through the spotter with a phone scope. I'll take another photo, draw what my potential approach is, and then I'll take notes um, in a notebook because everything looks different once you go over there. Same plan will be what we're doing today. It's just we're hiking 500 yards to the top of Glassing Knob instead of six miles in, but it's all the same. And uh, mule deer, they move all day, especially when it's hot and the sun's on them. So you have to take that into consideration on your stock. If there's a high probability of the sun hitting them before you get there, they're going to move. And so you really want to wait until you know they have a long period of time in a bed uh, where the sun's not going to hit them. Or you'll get over there, you'll be lost because you can't find them. I found a horse. Yeah. Can you went hunt horse with a horse? <laughs> seven months since I got any rain here, so it's super dry. glassing kind of how we go about it um, depending upon if you're with a buddy or not but usually what I'll do is I'll just grab tens or twelves and then I kind of pick low-hanging fruit so I fly around fairly spastic um, just looking at where deer should be once I'm done doing that if I haven't found anything I'll put these on a tripod and uh, I'll start gritting out with binoculars and when I'm doing that I, it's just like reading a book. I go from left to right, and then I lock this on this tripod. You've got a tilt and a pan. So basically what I'll do is keep it where the, I can't tilt it up and down, so I'm on the same plane. I'll glass left to right real methodically. And I'll usually go from top to bottom. So I'll glass left to right at the top of the ridge, figure out where the bottom of my object, objective was. I'll take the top down to where the bottom was and then grid left to right again, just like reading the book, all the way down the mountain. Once I'm done with that, you know, depending upon how big and how far and everything else, I'll go to the spotter and I'll really start to pick apart, especially once the sun comes up, any shaded uh, base of a tree, any kind of shade, base of rock cliffs and really pick apart that methodically. We, we just picked out a buck we found that's over there. 
they're behind a, a big cedar tree and we've been watching it for about 30 minutes they haven't come out of it so there's a good chance they're bedded behind that and then once that happens we start to stock we'll really get that mark get a lot of terrain features figured out where i want to make the approach and then scotty will flag me in but uh, but that's how we go about usually uh, gridding out depending upon if we have eights tens twelves fifteens a spotter whatever um, we kind of go up in power optics as we're gridding and we start out with the binos and that's all i have to say about that they're scared they're all they know you're there dude they're all moving up they're heading up 12 o'clock the fork and horn just popped out and he's up front that not work out like I wanted but it didn't work out at all I uh, got down there <clears throat> and I never saw the deer Leonard was talking to me through the earpiece and and uh, sounded like I was in fairly close but evidently I must have boogered him there somehow but I never even saw him Oh, cool. At least you guys were in them. We had more hunters at this point than we have deer, but this one's fairly approachable if the wind doesn't screw us. Thanks. Tell South the same thing. Good luck to you guys. I'll try not to shoot anything in the uh, foot or ass or anything like that. <laughs> well, Leonard said he blew a stock, and then I heard South in the background say, No, I passed up a deer. So. South blew a stock on a 4x4. Four four. It sounds like it was a good buck, I guess. So it sounds like they're in them over there. All right. We're going to drop drop down here. Hopefully be able to get on this deer. It's fairly approachable other than the wind's a little bit squirrely. So if the wind stays good, we, we should be in good shape. You ready? You ready? <laughs> redirect <laughs> let's go get a little closer and then see what it's doing we're about 50 to 75 yards from that dead tree so probably 125 from the deer as a guess one of the most important tech tips I can give right now is mark your shoes if you ask either South or myself or anybody else that does a lot of spot and stock We've all lost our shoes many times for a long time. I think South had to walk like two miles back to camp once without his shoes. I spent six hours looking for mine once after I shot my deer. <laughs> so, uh, my buddy uh, Wesley Warner built these for me and then I put my orthotics inside to help with cactus. So I've I got a, a sheep feet orthotic in here and that helps from stepping on cactus and getting them in your feet and they're still super quiet. So I guess they just got up and kind of just wandered off. I'm, I'm sure they just caught a whiff of our scent. The way that it's swirling, it doesn't take too much. And as close as we were, I thought we were about 125, but where we stopped was probably closer to 75 yards from them. And that's pretty much you're getting in the danger zone at 75 yards. And everything is critical at that point, including a slight gust of wind heading their way. Spotted a, a big buck with, how many does did that thing have? 
Yeah, I don't know, 12, 11, I don't know. Anyway, he's a big 4x4, big body, real old. So where he kind of hooked around, we're not going to be able to see from here. So we're going to drive the truck over this next knob, kind of hike out. And it looks like he's probably going to bury up in some juniper, see if we can't find him and pick him out in there and then make a play. So. We were just kind of sporadically glassing and I caught movement and there was, um, I don't know, 11, 12 or 13 does, I'm not sure, but they were sprinting down over here, coming across and had one big buck chasing them. And we, uh, well, Will, the guy on the camera now, had spotted a hunter over there. So I'm assuming either the hunter made a play on them or that he just didn't know they were there. And when they came through, they smelled them and then they took off down in this bottom. It's pretty windy, it snowed a minute ago, so I'm assuming they just buried up in this juniper thicket and you could easily hide 30 deer in this without even seeing them, so we're kind of waiting to see if they move again. Found a pretty nice buck and must be 10 or 12 does. He's chasing those does all around. They're just scattered like crazy. If you've got that many does with a buck, what's your play? I pray a lot. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. There's not a whole lot you can do. You got 26, 28 eyeballs. There's no like magical sauce. You just hope for the best when you make the approach. And I mean more than not you're you're just in trouble they've, they've gotten in that little bit thicker stuff the wind is good hands cold yeah i got blood flow problems in my hands you can see it's not good it's called ray nods but they turn purple it's pretty my daughter likes it we're kind of getting close enough to we're going to start still hunting more or less take a couple steps glass take a couple steps glass see if we can pick up one of the does there's a buck they can't be more than 100 150 yards from where we're at right now your way Scott Scotty spotted a buck while we were stalking those other ones and uh, with the way the wind is we could actually approach him from kind of his back his butt side, his butt's on our right, his head's on our left. The wind's kind of coming in our face, so we couldn't go directly behind him, but we could, what do you think, Scott? Circle to the right and kind of come in towards his ass. You just bell off and almost beeline to the right. Yes. And then once you, yeah. there's, it looks like it's a fairly deep little drop. 
as open as he is, you'll probably be able to see him once you go there. And if he stays there, yeah, pretty doable if he, if he don't move. He's tall. It's three o'clock, which means we need to hurry. <laughs> so they're gonna get up probably, if we're lucky, at 4.30, maybe at four. Let's give it a whirl. guys they said we're good to go on state trust land he said once we get in the thicker stuff we'll cut left oh. that's way more open than it looks i don't really have anything to say <laughs> oh man we had a a buck in a really good spot and um i probably went maybe a mile over here we thought we were far enough over to where he wouldn't see us. He was kind of in these openings over there. I thought he was in the thicker stuff at a mile away. It's kind of hard to tell. So we hooked way to his right, trying to loop behind him. And uh, obviously we weren't far enough over. He saw us and just bounded out. He was probably 200 yards over there. So we walked a long ways for no real reason whatsoever, which sucks, but. When, when Scotty told me, I looked up and I could see him running across that opening. It happens. I mean, I thought we were probably, I thought he was in that thicker stuff, so we were probably far enough over this way where he wouldn't see us, but that was not the case. So now we have the long walk of shame back. That sucked. First day, end of the first day, evening, freezing our behinds off up here on the ridge. Man, the wind's blowing. It's uh, clear and cold. No deer since those first bucks this morning. Uh, so, a little lean, but we're hoping that we can come back in here tomorrow morning. Day two, it's a bit brisk out. I think it was eight degrees. Will farted a minute ago, it landed on my foot, and I think he broke my toe, so it's pretty cold. But we spotted a big buck yesterday afternoon up on the top of this glassing point with like 13 does, and then uh, spotted another one later that we actually ended up blowing out. So I'm gonna go back up to the top, see if we can't spot that one with all the does and see if we can get on it. We had some hunting pressure yesterday uh, that uh, doesn't look like they're here today. So hopefully that'll help out a little bit. I think that's who pushed that buck out initially was those other hunters. So head up here, try not to freeze to death, see what happens. <laughs> should have service up here so if we don't I'll turn that radio on but yeah. I did yesterday so all right I'll see you in a minute so it's day two out here with South Cox what kind of weapon are you using
So Wes classed up that same buck from yesterday, and he's two ridges over, and uh, Leonard tried to radio me in. He's at the end of a long strip of open meadow, so I've got a decent marker that I should be able to keep track of him there. It looks like he's with the same group of does from yesterday. Well, we, we got kind of lucky and unlucky all at one time. We came out to the edge of this knob and just getting our crap together. I didn't really imagine there'd be deer right below us, but we didn't blow them out or anything, but there's three does right below us. And at this time of year, that means there's gonna be a buck around. So just be real quiet and then wait a little bit, kind of let them mellow out and that buck should come out. Well, I'm sure we'll know in the next 15 minutes and hopefully they stop looking at us. One of the does has kind of pinned us down, but. She hasn't blown out, so it's not that big of a deal. So running around right up on the top of the ridge. And I don't think that they're aware of us. I think that buck is pushing them around. I'm going to take my boots off right here. Well, that was a bust. So uh, the radio stopped working. So I didn't. I went in blind, and uh, Leonard said that before we got, you know, even close to where these deer were, something spooked them, and they ran like half a mile down this ridge line, and he lost them in the trees. So it's pretty much game over. So it's time to go find, hopefully, find some other deer to to go hunt. It's uh, 8:30 in the morning. So we better find ourselves a new glassing point and uh, get busy. A little trick. I had Will pee in this. You, you can tell he's dehydrated. But if you consume that, it warms your body core temperature. I, I wouldn't lie about that at all. Uh, burns the nostrils. Works 65% of the time, all the time. Yeah, you need to drink more water though. You're dehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that on Dumb and Dumber where the cop taking old daddy's cough syrup and he drinks some of his pee. <laughs> mm. We've got hunting pressure issues. Maybe maybe he'll run in this way. There's a one one hunter to our right and then one making a stalk out in front of us right now. I can't see what he's stalking, but he definitely was putting a sneak on. So there's two different methods when you're primarily when you're shooting a stick bow. One's instinctive just like if you're throwing a baseball where you're, there's nothing that you're using as a reference for aim. You're just looking at the spot you want to hit, focusing on it and, and then drawing back and shooting. And then there's another called gap shooting or you're using the point of the arrow in reference to where you want to hit. So typically what you'll have when you're gap shooting is what's called a point on, and that's where the point of your arrow is covering the spot that you want to hit. And my point on is about 35 yards. And uh, so if I'm shooting at something at 35 yards, I've got a really good reference because I just put the point of my arrow right on where I want to hit and then draw back till my clicker, which is just a, essentially a draw check and it makes a little, just a little click sound right there. And uh, once that clicks, then I know I'm, I hit full draw and then I'll just cut my shot. 
um, if I'm aiming, if I'm shooting at something closer than say 20 yards, then through trial and experience, <clears throat> then I'll know that like here's my point that I'm aiming at and my point of my arrow is here, it's gonna be below the target. And then as I get closer and closer to my point on, that gap shrinks and hence it's called gap shooting. And that's the method that I use where I'm using the tip of my arrow's reference. Um, so that's the long and short of aiming with a stick bow. This buck was on top of a, a knoll, so we're making a run at him right now. It's a long ways away. We actually had to drive over too far to run after him before dark. We're gonna get him on top and see if we can relocate him because it was he was a long ways away.